Hello and welcome. Today, we're going to be looking at the unit test for properties of waves. This is one of the topics in physics, both honors and standard. As always, we're going to be going through all nine of these questions to help you understand how to approach and solve these kinds of problems and ace a physics exam. If you like these videos or find them informative, please be sure to like and subscribe. And with that, let's get started on our first question. Here we go. Okay, the following pairs of wave pulses are traveling toward each other, one another. Which two pairs of wave pulses will result in constructive interference? What does constructive interference mean? Constructive interference means that the two waves, when they are on top of each other, they will, if you had like a wave like this and one like this, when those two collided, you'd end up with something that looks like this, right? They'd add on to each other. Then, of course, you have destructive interference, which is when, say, this one was like this. And then when you when they were together, they would do like a smaller one because they'd be canceling each other out. So essentially, we're going to have destructive interference when they're on opposite sides, like on A or on C. And you're going to have constructive interference when they're on the same side, like in B, they're both down, and D, they're both up. So those are our two answers, and we can keep going to the next question. All right. The properties of a sound wave are measured as the wave moves from water to air. Which two properties would you expect to change? Well, the one thing that we know doesn't change is going to be frequency. The frequency of a wave doesn't change, right, no matter what medium you go into, because the frequency is based on the what's actually like creating the wave itself. So the speed and the wavelength are going to change because, as we know, we have a formula that the wavelength times the frequency equals the speed. So wavelength and speed are our answers, and we can keep going to the next question. All right. Two students experiment with light by shining flashlights in a dark and dusty dark room. When the light beams cross, they see areas that have different brightness. Which of the following statements best explains what happened to the light beams after they pass through each other? Well, let's see. Let's think about what that's going on. So the, are these, these are light waves, right? These are essentially light waves. But once they pass through each other, well, one thing we know about collisions of waves that's very, very important is that when two waves collide with each other, right, like you might have like this and this, and then like when they collide, they might just be a flat line because they completely cancel each other out. But after that, they're going to be the same as they were before. Like right, waves, after they collide, they are going to continue undisturbed. They don't change. They are the same. All right, so the light will be completely unchanged. Our answer is A, and we can keep going to the next question. Which statement is true about a mechanical wave, but not true about electromagnetic radiation? All right, let's see. So a mechanical wave, can a mechanical wave travel through a vacuum? Well, no, right? It cannot travel through vacuum, it needs a medium. Mechanical waves need a medium. The second one is kind of the opposite of the first one. It requires a medium to propagate. Well, we know a mechanical wave needs a medium to propagate. What about an electromagnetic wave? Does it need a medium to propagate? I don't think so, but let's keep looking. It can travel through matter. Mechanical waves can't travel through matter, so our answer is going to be B. It requires a medium to propagate. Electromagnetic radiation doesn't need a medium to propagate. And we can keep going to the next question. A marching band crosses a bridge while playing a tune with all members stepping in sync. As they cross, the bridge begins to vibrate and shake. The, the drum major instructs the marcher to keep playing, but break the cadence and no longer walk in step. The bridge is stopped shaking. Okay, so let's think about what's going on, right? So the question is, which statement best explains whether or not this phenomenon is due to resonance? Now, before we do anything, let's think about what's actually going on here, right? This is, this is like, this is actually a very common thing, right? There are lots of stories about people when they walk in step like that long, and that they, um, when they, when they walk in like sink and step and they're all hitting at the same time and then like massive bridges even if they're built to be able to hold that much weight start swaying there was like i don't know how long ago this was but there was a bridge that completely collapsed in a matter of hours and because people who were walking on it just kept stepping the same amount all right so is that due to resonance well if it wasn't due to resonance then what would it be it would just be that people stepping on the bridge physically broke down the bridge. And that's not what's happening because this bridge is built to be able to hold that much weight, right? So it can't, it can't like not be due to resonance, right? It's not just because people keep stepping on it. That's not how anything works. 
So this is due to resonance. All right, this is due to resonance. And we so we have two options. Choice A, B, choice B is because the cadence of the march matched the resonant frequency of the bridge. Second one is the march man is playing notes at the resonant frequency of the bridge. Now let's think. So for C, apart from the fact that when they stopped and kept playing, the bridge stopped shaking, the idea that them playing notes is going to do anything to the bridge is is kind of laughable at that point because us, you're, you're playing, you playing notes, no matter how loud you're playing it, is not going to do anything to a bridge. A bridge is too big. It's not going to do anything to a bridge, right? Now, if you have like 100 people in marching men stepping on a bridge at the same time, then that's going to do something to it, right? So that's why the answer is B, right? Because first of all, it's more plausible. And second of all, we have empirical evidence, right? When they were doing, when they were playing and stepping, the bridge sh shook. When they were just playing and no, not stepping, the bridge stopped. So it's due to the marching, due to the cadence of the march, the stepping and sing, that's what caused the, the bridge to start swaying back and forth, to shake. And that's our answer. And we can keep going to the next question. The sound of a, the speed of sound in a guitar string is 430 meters per second. For the musical note B, the frequency of, of a string when plucked is 246.94 hertz. Calculate the wavelength of the musical note B. But one of the most important formulas, and at least in waves, right, that you learn is going to be, um, well, I mean, you can write it in various different ways, but one way you can write it is, uh, most common way that people write it is lambda, e that was a horrible equal sign, lambda equals um, V over F. So that's wavelength equals velocity over frequency, right? The way I like to think about it is wavelength times frequency equals velocity. Because if you have it that way, then you can like mess around with a bunch and nothing, and you can do a lot of things. But, so you have this, I'm trying to find the wavelength. So you plug in the velocity, 430, divided by the frequency in hertz, 246.94, and that gives you the nearest tenth, 1.7. That's it. That is it. And we can keep going to the next question. All right, so as we can see, using that formula, it's a very simple formula. And we can, you can use it a lot, and that's it, right? That, that, that's how many questions can be solved. All right, so question seven, a sitar. I love, this is an Indian instrument, instrument. It's very nice. It's a string, in, string instruments whose strings are plucked to produce sound. So the sitar also has additional strings that vibrate when certain notes are played, even though these strings are not picked, plucked. What causes the unplucked strings, strings to vibrate? They attract to the same post on the sitar. They vibrate when any of the musical notes played nearby, and they have the same natural frequency as the plucked, str as the plucked st string. All right, let's see. So it has additional no strings that vibrate when certain notes are played, even though those strings are not plucked, because the unplucked strings vibrate. So the let's let's look at which ones cannot be correct. For choice B, they say they vibrate when any other musical note is played nearby. Well, it's said only when certain notes are played. So it can't be this. It can't be just anything nearby. Second, the other two are connected to the same post on the sitar. It seems like it could have merit the same natural frequency as the plucked string. Hmm. If they had the same natural frequency, then when you pluck the string, right, would it cause resonance? Well, so those those sound waves are they're going outwards from the plucked string. And if they're going if they're are they going to hit right, are they going to hit the other string and make a certain? So that seems plausible. Right, so we have to decide if they're connected to the same post, which causes that, or if they have the same natural frequency as the plucked string. All right, let's see. So if if um, so we're entering this with like we don't know anything about the inner workings of the sitar because even if you did, it wouldn't be that much that helpful, um, like on a test or something because it's not it's not going to give you any kind of I most likely you haven't thought about the physics behind what you do. All right, so we're just entering this trying to figure out what truly is going on. How are these, how do these additional strings vibrate when other notes are played? How do these additional strings vibrate when other strings are played? Well, if you think about it, these those additional strings, they're not going to make the same sound. They're going to make different sounds. All right, I mean, that, so that's why they can't have the same natural frequency. And that, that's why they have to be connected to the same post on sitar. They have to be connected like con in contact and that's why they can 
see that's what that's what we're going to say is that that's why we can connect them and that's why the sound waves go but that's also actually incorrect and let's think about why that's incorrect right if, if being connected right if, if they were just connected to the same post then if you played any note there right then that would cause that to, that would cause that to vibrate and they only vibrate when you have certain notes right certain notes the same reasoning we used for choice b for choice b right here right not all it's not everything nearby is only certain frequencies so it must be matching that frequency. So the answer is C. And we can keep going to the next question. All right, visible light traveling through plastic has a wavelength of 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7 meters and a frequency of 6.17 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Check for the speed of light in this plastic. Okay, so we have, uh, if we remember, we have wavelength equals velocity over, or speed over frequency. Velocity and speed. The speed is the, is the magnitude of velocity. And we don't really care about the direction at all, so it, it works. So we multiply frequency on both sides, and we get wavelength times frequency equals velocity. So wavelength, 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7. 2.16 times 10 to the negative 7. Times frequency, 6.17 times 10 to the 14th. And that gives us 1.33 times 10 to the 8th times 10 to the 8th, and that is our answer, and we can keep going to the next question. All right. Seismic wave travels from rock into seawater. In rock, the wave has a speed of 3950 meters per second and a wavelength of 560. Let's stop right there. We can calculate a frequency. So the frequency is going to be velocity over wavelength, because we can divide by wavelength from both sides. And that gives us 3950 over 560 to be around 7.05. Now the one thing we know is that frequency is uh, changes based on what kind of wave it is, or right? what's starting it. If it goes to a different medium, it will keep the same frequency. So now even though it's in a different medium in seawater, same frequency. So now we can say the wavelength is going to be velocity over frequency. Velocity changes to 1500. Frequency is still 7.05. So that means that the wavelength becomes 1500 over that 7.05, which is 210 to the nearest 10. 210. And, we can, and that is it for this unit test on wave properties. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from it. If you like these videos, please be sure to like and subscribe. Be sure to stay tuned for next time when we continue looking at more physics topics on this physics course. I'll see you then.